We all know that microorganisms can be bad, bad for us, right? We see the pictures here, I'm reminded that about 10% of our agricultural plants are lost to plant disease every year. When that food reaches our table, we lose another third of that food in the USA alone due to waste and spoilage. We all know this, right? We look at our countertops, we see our rotting fruits. We also know that microbes can be bad for us because they make us sick. One out of six of us here, in the minimum, is gonna get some form of foodborne illness this year. That results in thousands of deaths in the USA alone each year, as well as hundreds of thousands of hospitalizations. So yes, microbes can be bad. I'm here to tell you though that some food microbes can be really good. So we've all this morning probably enjoyed some of these fermented foods and beverages that are the result of the good microbes we would find in our foods. If not, maybe last night we enjoyed some beer, wine, or spirits that were the cause of these good microbes in our foods. Might have had cheese, we might have had chocolate, coffee, tea, or something maybe a little more exotic for me, would be something like natto, like fermented soybeans. So how do we get these fermented foods? We start with very simple ingredients. It could be milk, it can be meats, it can be fruits, vegetables, or grains. And then what do we do? We don't even think about it. We might chop them, we might add a little salt, we might soak or cook them, and we incubate them perhaps in some salt water, and we wait. And what happens during those few magical hours, days, or sometimes weeks or months, is we release the nutrients that the good microbes need to grow. Those microbes would be lactic acid bacteria or yeast when we have a lot of sugars present, or we might get a more complex, rich type of fermentation that would be started with maybe some molds or enterics even, and then we would get growth of lactics and yeast in the end. So all of this is really coming down to a simple definition where we have these microorganisms are the, the result, they cause these new foods and beverages to be made. And not just a few, not just a few photos that I showed you, but literally thousands of different fermented foods and beverages consumed across the world. I really like this figure here is made by Michael Ganzel, University of Alberta. It's a periodic table of fermented foods and beverages. It's delightful. I hope you go and look for it. And when we think of fermented foods and beverages, we might think of their taste. I know I do. But really, we know they're also very, very ancient foods. They don't require machines. They don't require genetic engineering. They just require very simple processes that our ancestors did thousands of years ago before recorded history. And then we had recorded history about 10,000 BC is when we started to see the first fermented dairy foods. Recall maybe seeing in travels around the world in ancient Egypt, we had wine and beer and bread. And then today we have our elite cuisine, restaurants around the world making new kinds of fermented foods new kinds of beverages. Or we might be making our fermented foods and beverages at home. They're very simple processes. And what we know and what we learn in our classrooms about fermented foods and beverages is that, well, they can make our food safer. And that's one reason that they've persisted, one reason that our ancestors made them, one reason that uh, they were used to transport people across the oceans. Not only do they make them safer from foodborne pathogens, they also cause preservation of the nutrients that we would find in those fermented foods and beverages, or in the, in the raw ingredients to start with. But I'm here today to tell you another kind of message. In addition to these basic things we would learn into, in our classroom, that these fermented beverages are actually, can be, microbial powered nutrition. So we're starting to ask these questions. How could our fermented foods and beverages pre bring us more? Can they give us more than making our food safe, making it last longer, or making it just taste good, right? That's always what I enjoy. <laughs>
And so looking at this, looking at the literature and human studies, there aren't many, showing just a few here, where in human studies, either longitudinal, observational, or placebo-controlled crossover design studies, fermented foods and beverages have been examined to provide more than basic nutrition. So for example, if we look at fermented dairy products, particularly yogurt, there's a number of longitudinal studies, observational studies, and meta-analyses showing that fermented dairy has an inverse correlation with cardiovascular disease. There's also a reduction of risk for type 2 diabetes. If we look at plant-based fermented foods, we could look at kimchi, where there's been some nice studies done in South Korea showing, in a, this is in a crossover design study, that fresh kim, kim, kimchi, which would be cabbage and radishes, doesn't provide the same kind of benefit as the fermented kimchi does in terms of increased insulin sensitivity, reduce uh, weight gain, and decrease fat mass. So those are just a couple examples, but we could look beyond. We could look at reduced inflammation in the intestine with rye bread, and we all probably know if you're drinking tea or coffee, we have a good feeling, right? And so looking at these foods as bring more to us than just regular nutrition. And so we're here to ask the question, how can these microbes do this? Well, they're really very simple three ways. So one of these ways we can think about it is the microorganisms transform those raw ingredients into something new. Or they take away something in those raw ingredients, for example, grains, that we don't want to be there. An example of this is phytic acid and removal of this anti-nutrient by fermentation. So phytic acid is a, is a compound that will bind metals and prevent their absorption into our body. Another example in transformation is improving the digestibility. And a great example of that is improving lactose tolerance. Removing lactose uh, for, in dairy foods um, for lactose intolerance individuals. And that might we see in the West, but also around the world, we see porridge as a weaning food, a fermented porridge as a weaning food. So increasing digestibility, removing sugars that cause flatulence is another example. Besides transformation of those ingredients, we might get something new, like synthesis of vitamins, production of conjugated linoleic acid, production of neurotransmitters like GABA, Fermented foods might also have new synthesis of polysaccharides. And some of these polysaccharides are, are going to resist digestion in our stomachs and reach our large intestine where they can be metabolized by our gut microbes as prebiotics. So these are just a few examples of what's provided new in fermented foods. And then lastly, our fermented foods can provide living microbes. Not all. But for example, fresh sauerkraut, fresh fermented olives, yogurt, cheese. So when we consume for fresh fermented foods, we're increasing the microbes in our diet between 100 to 10,000 fold each day. In the US, we know our typical diet is not, we're not getting a lot of living microbes. We might have a million cells per day. In Europe, where a lot of yogurt is eaten, that's increased by 100 fold. But imagine the power if we had more of these fermented foods. And you might see labels like this, live and active cultures as a signal on yogurt. And we can ask ourselves, is this really important? Do we need more microbes in our diet, particularly the good kinds? Well, what we know is over the past 100 years through industrialization, we've removed a lot of microbes from our, from our lives through sterilization and through making our food safer. So we have to ask ourselves a question, could we benefit from exposure to more living microbes. And while this is a hypothesis, for example, the hypoth hygiene hypothesis, there's some evidence to support that having more exposure to microbes uh, reduces the risk of allergy and um, atopic dermatitis. Another interesting parallel between these microorganisms in fresh fermented foods is that some species we would also find used as probiotics, some strains, are given to people with the intention that they're gonna confer a health benefit. So two examples of these species here would be uh, Lactobacillus plantarum and Lactobacillus casei. And in my lab, in my research, 
we're really interested in these organisms in the context of themselves as probiotics and as a whole in, in fermented foods. So for example, we're interested in Lactobacillus plantarum. This organism we find in many fresh fermented foods like kimchi and sauerkraut. And we're interested in a particular antimicrobial that it's making called a bactericin, plantaricin EF, where we just take that particular bactericin, it's the two peptides, we apply it onto CACO2 cells in vitro, and we find that, this or, that these peptides alone are sufficient to maintain the barrier when those uh, cells, the human cells, CACO2 cells, are exposed to pro-inflammatory cytokines interfering gamma and TNF-alpha. On the right, you would see that we also study another organism called Lactobacillus casei, and we, we study it not just alone, but we study it in the context of fermented milk. And what we find is we combine the two together, Lactobacillus casei and milk, we find that it's protective against inflammation. And we've seen this in an inflammatory model of ulcerative colitis. This does better when combined than when either the milk or the organism is provided separately. So to put this all together, we see that microbes can be good for us. Fermented foods can provide more than just our basic nutrition through synthesis, transformation, and the provision of living microbes. And I just want to expand your mind to think even beyond that. Using really non-technological approaches, what we can do, not only with improving our health and mitigating preventing chronic disease or nutrition, but if we look up the chain, what we can do with our microorganisms, increasing shelf life times even more than we have, and for foods that we want to keep fresh and natural without preservatives. We can diversify the types of products that we have, just using our creativity, changing temperature, changing incubation times, changing microorganism exposures. And then even before that, we can take our food waste and we could come up with new ingredients, maybe beyond the ferment itself or we could come up with new foods and beverages. So with that, I wanna thank you for being here with me and acknowledge the, the great people in my group. And that's all.